What's up, everybody? I'm Andrew Barry. I am the founder of Curious Lion and the course guy on Twitter and all over the internet. And I'm really, really excited today to have Marcio Santos, uh, who is the founder of Nerd Digital. Marcio, how are you doing? Are you calling in from, are you joining from Toronto, right? Yes, I'm joining from Toronto. Andrew, thank you so much for opening the doors for me and, and welcoming me into your, your community. It's, I'm happy to chat. Uh, I know that you chatted with Kay, so excited to jump in, man. Yeah. Well, so, so Kay, Kay, he speaks exceptionally highly of the work you've done with him. I know you've worked with him on three of your cohorts, of his cohorts, um, and you've helped him scale, supercharge your productivity to, to, to crazy levels. Um, so I've, I've had a peek into what you're going to present today. I'm so excited to learn from, from you and to learn about the, the lessons and, and, and mistakes that you made with Kay and, and everything that you guys have, have, have grown from, from there. So anybody listening in just as a quick housekeeping, um, there is a chat on the right hand side. If you haven't used, um, I think that will, what is what it'll look like on your side. Um, and you can post in there. Uh, any questions, I will feed those back to Marcio. And I think there's also an ability for me to bring you up onto stage as well. Um, but just wanted to, and, and if you are listening now, you can hear me, just put in there where you're calling in from. I see we've got Grigory from Moscow and we've got Isaac from Mexico. So already a very interesting um, mix. We've got France in the house as well. Um, so very, very cool to see. So we've got oh, Tunisia. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so yeah, keep, keep posting in there. And, and like I said, if you have any questions, um, pop them in. Oh, we got someone just, uh, just near you there up in Quebec. Casey, hey, welcome. Happy, Casey. Um, very cool. All right. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to hand the reins over to you, Marcia, and take it away. Awesome. So everybody, thank you so much for, for joining. What we're here to, to talk about is how to scale your course to six figures without spending all your cash on Facebook ads. And we're going to dive deeply into a case study of Rad Reads. This is my friend and client, Kehi. And hopefully uh, what me and Andrew want to do is teach you as much as we can um, so that you can launch your own course as well. Uh, today will be broken up into these four parts. So we have a discovery phase, essentially the process that we use to, to help Kehi scale. And um, I think through this, you'll be able to learn uh, a lot. So just very, very quickly about me. This is me, Marcio Santos. Uh, I was born in Brazil, but I live in Canada and Toronto now. I really do marketing because I love it and I have fun doing it. I left agency world seven years ago and, you know, so I could have more time to, to be with my son, with my mom, with my wife. Uh, and since then, I've helped dozen as friends, worked on lots of interesting campaigns, uh, projects, and, you know, work with some fantastic brands. And so, that's just uh, a little bit about me. And now back to, to Kay. So Kay, he um, created this course, Supercharge Your Productivity. He's a founder of Rad Reads. And very quickly, the course itself is a what we call a cohort-based course. And this little graphic here was created by our, our colleague, Tiago Forte from Forte Labs. And he puts that, the way he posits this is that there are four ways of online education. We started off with these MOOCs. And we're at today at these cohorts. And I think one other thing that you could think about when it comes to the value of a cohort-based course, if you are thinking about um, organizing a cohort-based uh, course or launching one or, or considering even taking one, one thing that isn't on this scale is the transformation that you offer to the people that take your course. On the left-hand side, we might have courses that are, are these self-serve courses, right? So think of these as almost like a book, a digital book, where you go on a shelf, you buy it, and you, you essentially do the work yourself. You open it, you read it on your own time, you figure things out in your own time. Whereas on the other side, you have these cohort-based courses where you're doing this with a cohort, and at you're learning, you're asking questions, and you're growing. And so uh, studies have shown that people that take these individual off-the-shelf courses, these evergreen courses, they don't always finish the course and they don't always get a real transformation from the course. Whereas with the core based course, uh, you get a lot of transformation and it really able help to help your audience and to grow your business. So this is really how everything started with, um, with 
my work with Kay is, is just a simple little email. It's, it's really this long. Uh, it's an intro, introduction from a, a friend from uh, Kevin Lee from Indy Eats. And eventually this is what I got back from Kay. He, you know, just four bullet points and, uh, you know, five bullet points here. And the, the three things that jumped out at me the most were most of his posts were related to Notion, so the Notion software. Uh, two is that he posts a lot and not all of his content gets a lot of traffic. And then three, that his site health, this is like uh, from Inside Ahrefs, if you know that tool, Inside, when he ran a site audit, he saw that his site received a 43 out of 100. So he these three things jumped out at me. I was like, okay, well, I, I, I think I can help him with these things. Um, when I started working with him was uh, SYP7, so Supercharger Productivity 5. I, I said 7, it's 5. And as you can see here, he was pretty much stuck at um, the five-figure level with his course launch. It's already super successful, right? By by you know any anyone's um, measure, uh, doing five-figure launches is already great. But um, and, and actually, one thing that you'll notice here is that before we we got to six figures, we actually had a dip. So he had done a little bit better without me. When I came on, we actually had a, a little bit of a dip, even though we focused on some other areas that you're going to see that weren't exactly launch related. But after that, we were able to have uh, significant growth. Now, if you don't know where you are going, you'll end up someplace else. That's what Yogi Bear said. And I put this in here really to, to highlight that it's important to have a plan whenever you're moving forward. And whenever you're working on a course launch, you're redesigning a course, you're trying to optimize it, you're always trying to balance these two things. There's always a yin and yang to, to both sides of, of optimizing growing your business, where you're straddling between brand and performance. Performance is all about how many leads am I getting? How, how many sales am I getting? And you know how many people are visiting my website versus brand is like, you know, what is the long-term value that I'm offering to people? How am I positioning myself in the market and how will people remember me by? So how do we do this? How do we straddle the brand and performance side? And, and kind of, this is the question that we were left with, right? How do we grow 10K style? This 10K is, is K's framework that he created, right? This 10K framework. And for us, on, in terms of brand, what we know is that um, we wanted to do, we always wanted to do high leverage work. We have a high quality brand, so we have very, very, very few um, refunds. The last cohort, we actually had just one. There's one refund in the last week. Um, and we always want to focus on doing high ROI. And what, what this really means is we want to do work that fits with the business as well. So we have a very small and lean team. I, I, I think he only has like one person on his payroll. And so everything there is very lean. It's very high leverage. And so everything that we we're going to plan forward, the activities had to fit this. So let's go with launch number one. And when we started this, as I said, we're going to go through these four phases. And the first phase where we began is this discovery phase. And when, when we're looking at discovery, this is something that you want to jot down is when you're evaluating your course, there are three main things that you can evaluate them against. The first is the product. How well is your product set up? The second are your content and funnels. This is essentially how do you uh, attract people or rather how do you uh, yeah, attract them, but also convert them into leads and then prospects. And then later is your launch strategy. How, you know, what, what techniques are you using? How, what's, your, what's your plan and strategy like to launch your course? And we, we balanced this against past performance. So we looked at, you know, what he had done in the past, how his emails had uh, performed and how his traffic had performed. And we identified the content and funnel phase as the most important place for us, the most um, place that would give us the most leverage. And at the time, the, his funnel looked like this, right? So his funnel was essentially made up of his blog, his YouTube, and he had lead generation as his main conversion goal. Um, and so, what we did here is a strategy became, okay, so for the blog, what we're going to do is we're going to use SEO. We're going to do a mixture of both technical and content. On YouTube, we're going to do some video SEO. So we saw some low-hanging opportunities there. And then for lead generation, we're going to do some conversion rate optimization. So I'm going to break down these things for you in the presentation. This is an overview of what your cohort-based course funnel can look like. You don't have to have all these things and I'm not saying that this is the 
uh, the best funnel that you could possibly have, but this is the funnel that we have in place today. Now, when we had our first launch, we did not have all these pieces in place. We essentially had traffic and then we had a launch, right? And then in here as well, we had some emails, but there was, there's a whole lot of things that we added that I'm going to show you as we, as we unpack these and I'll, I'll explain these that we didn't have to begin with. So on to SEO. And if you've done SEO, if you've read SEO, if you've been into SEO at all, you know that there's a lot of stuff that you can do. You can fix titles, meta descriptions, multiple tags, indexable content, what's indexable, what's not. You can fix internal pages, uh, internal errors, fix optimized indexability, no index pages, links, external links, uh, um, no follow links. You can have redirects, non-indexable content. You can, I mean, there's so much redirects and uh, the, the list goes on and on. Social tags and, and schema markup, CSS, JavaScript, there's so much that you can do with SEO. And our approach to SEO really is, I mean, you could go this brute force intent style with, with your SEO, or you can go, go with something more effortless. And as you, if you know anything about Kay, his style is definitely more, more easygoing. And I, and I'm with him on that, uh, on that uh, approach as well. Sometimes when you when he sent me that that score, that health, site health score, forty three out of a hundred. I know that maybe not him, but a lot of people when they see that, they just want to punch their their website, right? They just want to punch through the screen and they want to get rid of it. But I'm going to show you that there's a way that you can use a bit of a bonsai technique where you simply just trimming a lot of the things that you don't need on your site to optimize it, and that can actually improve your SEO. So when you start off with SEO, a really important thing to do is a site audit. And after the site audit, which I'm not going to get into the details of, we found that content optimization and user experience optimization were the two biggest opportunities for us. When it came to, so these are the results, just very quickly, uh, the results that we get, got. So over the past 12 months, our, our acquisition in terms of organic traffic today is up 551%. This is from Google Analytics. Our engagement, so this is a... You, you may not know this, but when we talk about user engagement, this is an, an important ranking factor for SEO. It's often believed that you have to create new content, post new content, optimize your existing content to improve your rankings, but actually engagement. If you can improve engagement in your content, this can also help boost your, your rankings, which will then improve your traffic. And so the site health score as well, we went from 43 to 98. So this is essentially what this means is you're making Google happy. When you get rid of all those errors or the, at least the most important errors, the, what this does is it keeps the, the Google's bot help happy and it'll com come back to keep crawling your website. And so that's a, that's a good thing. So before the site optimization, this is something, what this is, this is a visualization of what the site looked like in terms of the amount of posts and pages and links that are on the website, right? So we did a crawl and then we did this visualization and this is what the page looked like. And so this middle circle here, this is the home page. And then all of these other little dots here, these are other pages. And so you can see that there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff here, a lot of lines and these lines in between are just links pointing from the home page to an author page pointing to a category page or whatnot. And after the site optimization, you can see that there's a few things that I, that I'll call out here. One is that there are much fewer links, right? So if you, much fewer pages. So, um, if you think about all those dots, there's a lot fewer. There are also fewer lines in between, right? So it's much more streamlined. And also you notice that these little circles are much bigger. And what this means is that we are now sending more authority. We're sharing more authority between these important hub pages here. Beforehand, a lot of what we call link authority or link juice was being spread way too thin, right? Whereas now it's concentrated on the most important pages. And I'm going to show you one of those really important pages in a second. One thing that happens is if you're running a WordPress blog um, and you create a lot of blog posts, the first thing that you'll notice is um, that, sure, it lists all your blog posts. The thing is, is that this isn't in any really real specific order. And another thing to, 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 to think about here is, is you, if we think about this in context of how many blogs are out there today, and I'd like to actually ask you in the chat, if you know how many blogs are out there today, uh, Andrew, I don't know if anybody wants to, to guess, but there are a lot, a lot. Yeah, and anybody got a guess? How many blog posts, how many blogs are out in, out in the world? Like 
I'm guessing 100 million. Anybody else got a guess? That's okay. If nobody has a guess. Yeah, so, so the number is 1 billion. Believe it or oh, not, there, there are a billion. Gregory got that. Yeah, so there are a yeah. billion blogs out there. Great, great, great job, Gregory. And what this means is that we don't need another blog out there, right? We're not starving for a lack of knowledge or for a lack of content. What we're starving for is a lack of relevance, a context. And so if we just look at this, this scale of topical organization, when you first start a blog and you, 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 you create this, these different blog posts, the blog page, the way it's going to be organized is simply just random content. It's, even if you post on a similar topic, there could be topics that are advanced, some topics that are from last year, some topics that are about a, a subtopic. So it's, it's really random. On the other end, you have completely personalized content. And this is difficult to achieve. You can achieve this with some expensive software. But for us, we want to kind of play in this middle here. So you can have specific content, and this might be like a, a category page. So if you think of like, if we're talking about Notion, you could have a page that's just on Notion. But we can take it one step further and make this both specific and sequential. And so by doing this, what we did is we created this hub page. So we transformed all of his blog posts, um, or rather we organized his blog posts and we reorganized his Notion page into this, what we call a journey page. And if you're a course creator, this probably looks pretty similar to how you would organize your course, right? So it's on a specific topic. This is what you're teaching. And then it's in a specific sequence. So the user, Again, working in the context of being a, of there being a billion blogs out there, working in the context of people are super busy, distracted, and they want something relevant. When they land on this page, they know for sure that they're in the right place if they're looking for Notion help. Two, they can self-identify and say, okay, am I a novice? Am I an intermediate? Or am I more an advanced user? Where do I want to go? And as they, as they you know, play around in here, they can um, start with some basic stuff, but then they can later on go to some, some advanced stuff. Hey, this... a quick question on on that, Masia, yeah. Masia, if you don't mind. Um, the mm -hmm. the process for that, like, how uh, the if that that uh, those two diagrams you showed of the before and after, like, blew my mind. Uh, what was just tactically? What does that look like? Like, do you have to go through every post? You categorize them, put them in different buckets. Um, how, how does that just briefly look like? Yeah. So. The way we do this is we use a few tools that we call site crawlers and we crawl mm -hmm. the site, we create a report from there and then we look at um, a few things. So how much traffic does each page get? How many links does it have? Uh, does it have duplicate content? It's, it's a, I mean, it's pretty thorough what we do. Um, and then we figure, okay, which one of these can we delete? And essentially all mm -hmm. the pages here that you see that are like disappeared, we essentially deleted them. So it goes contrary to a lot of the advice that you might hear from an SEO consultant is, you know, create more, create more, create more. Actually, what we did is we actually deleted something mm. like 100 or 200 pages. And, and a lot of like, these you can find, tactic, if you want a tactic here, is um, tag pages. So oftentimes when you set up uh, a WordPress blog, you'll you find, you know, you can set up tags, you can set up categories and author pages. Tags and, and uh, category pages, oftentimes what you'll find is if you go there, they'll just repeat the same content that has just mm. been tagged, right? And you can, you can do this. I'm not going to open this up right now, but if you simply go to, to Google and you do a site colon and type in your, your address, your, your site address, you'll be able to see all the mm. pages or a good amount of the pages that Google has indexed. And if you just mm -hmm. go through though, you'll be able to see like, are all those pages, do, do all those pages really need to be there? Mm. It's like a pruning, like weeding out of, of all of the, the content you have. Exactly. And then, and then after that, what we did is we, we simply, you know, because he said most of his posts are on Notion, most of his traffic comes from Notion, it's like, well, let's double down on this. Right. And so we, we organize this page. And there's, there's some more stuff. You can go to um, bradreads.co forward slash Notion to see this page. Another little bit of work that we did on the SEO side was around keyword research. And again, we're, we're trying to do as, as you know, the 80, 20, we want, we don't want to do all the things we want to do the things that are going to make the most impact for us. And so what that meant was work on existing content. And we spent about 80% on existing content and then 20% on new content opportunities. And so these are, this is just a highlight of some of the pages that we worked on in terms of existing content. 
basically just optimizing them as much as possible. In the next phase, what we did in terms of uh, optimization, after we did the SEO stuff, we went into this this other stuff. And so I'll, I'll, I'll just read this. Brands increase ROI by 223% using this one tactic. And so if anybody, again, Gregory, maybe you want to guess at what this tactic is. Um, <laughs> I'll, let you, I'll let you take a guess. But this is often overlooked. And it's often believed that you have to do things that are super difficult and use super complex software to get this done. Um, but it's, it's not, uh, not so. So I'll show you in the next slide if anybody has taken a guess yet. The guess is call to action. So that's a, that's a good guess. And it is somewhat related. And what we did is actually it's conversion rate optimization, which is within that, the umbrella. And yeah. you can see here after three weeks of, yeah, of doing a little bit of, of, of CRO, we're able to increase our goal completions by 58%, goal value by 53%, and goal conversion rate by 20, almost 23%. So this, this has been super for us. Wow. Yeah. When it comes to CRO, again, there are lots of things you could do, right? But what we chose to do, what chose to focus on was time on page, pages per visit, which these are, are supported by SEO. So the SEO work that we did by, by restructuring the pages, by getting rid of stuff that wasn't good, um, by highlighting things that were more important. So one thing that I didn't show you here, that I didn't call out, was the, the menu structure here. So here, I should have this on the next slide. The menus, we optimize the menus as well. So previously, you'll see on, on one of the upcoming slides is that we had a lot of um, buttons in there. And so we focus on these metrics so that we could optimize for conversions. We knew that these would contribute to better conversions. So this is what the mobile page looked before we optimized. And so again, our, our main conversion metric here was leads, right? And as you can see here, he didn't even have a lead form to begin with on the, at the top above the fold, what we call above the fold. And it's important whenever you're optimizing your website to start with mobile. So Google um, updated their index so that they prioritize mobile indexing first. And so it's important for you to optimize your site for mobile. Most people visit and browse pages on mobile, so do that first. And so as you can see here, the simple, just a simple tweak, we just made sure that the form that we had was a little bit more outstanding. And on desktop, another thing that you see here, so you see the menu had a lot of different uh, links. We got rid of a, a lot of those, and we just have two now. We, I think today we have three, but at the time when we went to the first round, we just had it like this. So another few things that we, uh, just to point out here that we did, is we made these logos a little bit uh, bigger. This text, we broke it up so that it could be more clear what the value proposition was for the reader that's coming to the site. And then we also used a little bit more social proof to, so that people would, again, stick more, convert more, um, and, and improve our numbers. Just a quick note on this is if you're ever doing um, conversion rate optimization, don't try and waste your time on button colors and small little tweaks. Like, like what we did here, go ahead and make broad changes. It's better if you focus on you know, making several changes that you know are likely to work than in trying to micro-test these button colors or button sizes, for example. Mm. We implemented some um, of your run-of-the-mill. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so just as you're going into this now, it's uh, that that's um, the call to actions that Tunisia was talking about. I know your name's probably not Tunisia, but that, that's what's showing up there. Um, and um, I, I, then Isaac, I see your question. I'm going to bring that up. I don't want to interrupt Marcia's flow. So, so you can you can continue. Okay. We also implemented what I was saying, you know, your run of the mill exit intent pop-ups. These, these also worked great. Um, a ribbon. So once the course was launched, we made sure to deploy a ribbon to increase distribution for, uh, for the launch. It's common, for example, that you can think that, oh, I launched, I sent out my emails. Everybody knows about my launch. That, that's not the case. Everybody's busy. Everybody's like in their own world. And so, by making this super obvious on the homepage and actually put this on every page, we were able to see um, a little bit of a lift. So we actually put this on later. We, I know that we were at a phase, like we had open cart and the numbers weren't great. And then we launched this ribbon 
so that we can increase, you know, visibility on the launch. And then we saw a little bit of a lift from there. I don't have the number on that, but I remember that happening. <clears throat> Next, I want to talk to you a little bit about video SEO. So we've talked about SEO, we've talked about some CRO stuff, and now some SEO. And YouTube is huge. So if you look at any of the stats, 2020 video on the internet will eat up a bigger share of increased web traffic. I think we're there or above this by now because I think this uh, this report is pretty old. Um, another thing that I would that I would point out here, and this is the richest of communication channel. This is is something that you could you know screenshot and use. Or actually, these these slides will be available for download later. And basically, what this means is how rich is the channel of communication that you're choosing? If you're going to send. Um, you can send something in a detailed document, or you can have a face-to-face -face conversation. And then in between those, you have all these other channels. Whereas, and so video is somewhere here in the middle. It's not exactly a conversation because it's, it's just, um, if you're just video, it's just, you know, shooting it out. Whereas conversation is something like this, right? You can maybe have a, on, if you're on WhatsApp with somebody, that would be a video conversation. So a, a video message might be, you know, somewhere in here. And, Again, going with the context that people are being busy, distracted, and whatnot, if you can, if your content can be richer, then it's more likely that you're going to be able to get their attention. And as Seth Godin said, marketing is no longer about the stuff you make, but the stories you tell. And video it's is just, a great medium. Yeah, yeah. And, and so on that point, can you go back to that graph quickly? Because I think there's a couple couple things there to unpack, which that that quote really hammers at home, right? The the story. So. The the axis on the left there is um, the x axis is or the y rather is the communication effectiveness. So the idea is that the more face to face, the more personal it is, the more effective the communication is. And when it says richness of communication, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So like it's hotter. Um, I, I'm guessing that's also like to do with the the um, the immediacy, right? The the proximity to the person. Uh, and the, and so effectiveness being face to face is more effective because the other person can ask questions and, and have more of an interaction with the, the medium. Yeah, yeah um, I, think, I think you're right. I think it, it has to do with, with more of the interaction of the channel. So the detailed yeah. document is cold, so it's low on interaction, whereas a face to face communication is highest because you can read, when face to face communication, you can read things like body language, facial expressions. Or is the person mm. sweating? Are they hyperventilating? And plus, you can see how they're responding to you. If you cross their arms, or they cross their arms? Right? What's the, how, yeah. loud, how loud is their voice? How soft is their voice? So face-to-face -face is definitely the richest. Yeah. Yeah, and, and video, like you said, sits nicely in the middle there, um, which we obviously, obviously don't all have time for face-to-face -face conversations. It, that's impossible. So this allows you to scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for yeah. sure, man. And so with video SEO, what, what, the, the way to think about this is, is to think that, uh, to realize that the more engagement, the more relevance, and the more video views you get, well, basically you're doing more marketing, right? So you're getting more eyeballs, more people are getting to know, like, and trust you. And this is essentially how, this is the formula for you to increase your video performance on YouTube. It's not through doing keyword research necessarily, it's not uh, necessarily through trying to rank first on, on search. It's, it's optimizing your videos for engagement, for relevance, and to get more video views. So this is just a quick graph of performance, um, what we were able to achieve with, um, with the work that we did for on, S on uh, video SEO on YouTube. And within a few weeks, this is probably, I don't know, three, three months maybe, we increased total views by 41%, subscribers by 34%, and uh, monthly views by 14%. And today, this was just taken uh, a few days ago, so July 6th, we've grown by over 70% from where we were uh, 12 months ago. So uh, pretty solid performance, given that we haven't really invested too much in that channel. And we, we optimize a lot of the, the run of the mill things that you would expect. Like we did optimize titles and tags and descriptions. We made a few video edits and then we optimized the channel as well. So I'll, I'll point these out for you here. So this is what the Radrees channel looks like today. So we have a, a banner that's created up there. So this is important for you if you want to brand your, your YouTube channel to help you stand out and to help 
clearly communicate what is the value that people are going to get out of these videos. A second thing is having a, an interesting and eye-catching icon. So this is very bright. It shows his face. He's really the face of all of the videos, and so it makes sense to have him there. The About page is optimized as well. The first video that we feature here is, is like we handpicked that video for specific reasons. The playlists as well. So yeah, as you can see here, creating playlists is, is helpful and it helps your, your user see, you know, what are the different topics that you're talking about? And where should I go? Uh, what do I want to learn about? The thumbnails as well. So we did a little bit of optimization on the thumbnails. This is definitely something you don't want to sleep on because that's, it you know, how people end up engaging with your content is through the thumbnails first. Um, and it's a big opportunity is on the recommended videos. So as I said, you don't necessarily want to rank, try to rank for the top search term. So don't try to rank for uh, productivity, but simply try to rank next to the videos that are ranking for productivity. That's, that's the, the approach that we used. Pointing out here that just the titles that we optimize as well. So uh, front loading the, the, your target keyword to the front is, is common practice. Now I want to get into measurement and I don't know if I'm going too fast or too slow. How am I, how am I doing here, Andrew? No, you, you're great. Yeah, cool. Thank you. So this is just a quick, uh, I'm going to jump, jump into these in a little bit more depth, but this is just a quick overview of one of the dashboards that we have set up so that we can keep track of all of our numbers so that we know you know how to respond and what to do, what's working and what's not. And this we created in Google Data Studio. So this right here is, um, it, it, this is just like, a, I just zoomed in here a little bit so you could see here uh, that we track different types of leads. So not all leads are created equal for us. We know that some people that are reading, you know, the 10K content are different than those reading Notion content that are different from reading other content. And so we want to see how those three types of leads are performing. And we actually score these leads differently. So previously in the presentation, I said that our uh, goal value had increased. Well, the reason why the goal value increases is that, you know, each of these uh, lead buckets have different values attributed to them inside Google Analytics. Um, here we look at top KPIs per channel. So these are our top channels here. I've redacted some of the numbers here just, just to keep those private. But essentially what we're doing here is we're looking at our top channels and then we're looking at the month over month. So this is May and then June. And then we're looking at the same dimensions here, right? So the same, uh, actually the same metrics across these dimensions here. And so we can look at, you know, how did we do for users in direct uh, in June versus versus May? How did we do in email, um, you know, May versus June? So we can very at a glance see this information. Um, this report, quick question. You, yeah, go ahead. Quick question on that, if you don't mind. Um, the How did the YouTube traffic play into this? Because uh, you mentioned earlier, like you didn't put a lot of emphasis on it. I'm wondering if you focused on being consistent or rather just having really high quality videos, no matter how long it took to make each one. And then how did that play into these KPIs? So that's a, that's a really good uh, question. And I, that's something that I have to go back and report on a little bit better because I don't have a really clear view of the attribution from those people that land on YouTube or interact with YouTube and then come over to our to our channel. I don't have those numbers, but we have mm -hmm. conducted a few user interviews and many of them have mentioned that in their buyer journey, they start looking for Notion. And then after they start looking for Notion, they'll watch a video from, you know, Andrew Barry or Mary Poulin or from, from somebody. And then eventually they land on K. And at that mm. point, once they land on K, then they like, okay, cool. I really like this guy. Like his style is cool. I like him. And then, you know, mm. they, they, they get into his email list and then that, that's it. They're just, they're converted forever, so right? That is such a key point that you're making there. And everyone listening to, to really think about that because there are lots of people that teach Notion and there is no one way to teach Notion. Like this, we're just using Notion as an example here because that's what Kay started teaching on at least. Um, and, and the key thing is the identity that you mentioned. That's such an important point. And, and YouTube is a great way to get that identity. It goes back to that chart. That's why I was so interested in that. Like the effectiveness and the richness of the communication is so much higher in video than it is reading a blog post. 
and it's that. So I think there's something really, really important about this that you, the way you teach is is often how why people will decide to go with you. Like the way you teach, the style you have. You mentioned that word as well, and and that comes across so much in, in videos. So yeah, it's super. I think it's super uh, growth area for for a lot of course creators. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you asked about being consistent. So yeah, we didn't we didn't invest too much in YouTube at the time. Kay had already created some videos, and so essentially what we did is okay, let's just use what we have now and optimize that. And so that's really the scope of the work that we did. We just focus on what was already created. In this last report here is um, this is one of my favorite ones. It looks like a mess because I hit all the numbers, but I'm going to point a few things out for you here. Basically, what this is trying to do is tell us. As you know, at the day that we go into the report, where where do we stand in terms of our goals for that month? So how are we pacing uh, versus versus this month? And the way we break this down are these these three buckets, right? Acquisition, behavior, and conversions. And so in terms of acquisitions, we look at users to date and new users to date. And this black line right here and this one right here, this is our target for the month. So that is where we want our, this blue line to be. And as you can see, the day that I took the screenshot, we we're already ahead of our goal. And so what this does, what this allows us to do is go into the report. We don't even have to look at the number. We can just look at the, at the bar and say, look, hey, we're, we're low on average pages per visit. Why is that? Like what happened here? What's going on that our average pages per visit is low? Did we publish something that's not relevant? Do we make a change that is messing our, up our numbers? What's the deal? Right. So at a glance, we could do that. And then in terms of conversions as well, so our leads, we're, we're right at where we want to be in terms of leads. And here we've only broken it out by two types of leads, but we could break this out further too, right? So we can have 10K leads here and say, okay, what's our goal for the month? And where are we? How are we pacing? Is that lightning? Yeah, we just had thunderstorms here in New Jersey. <laughs> wow, that's really loud. <laughs> that is loud. I might have to go and mute if this continues. <laughs> wow. And, and this is a, a growth model that we're, we're developing a little bit more. And so what this, what I want this to do is to have a clear view of our growth per launch. And so here we have, you know, the date the cart closed. And then I want to fill this in with all the numbers. I have some numbers filled in already, but I want to, uh, you know, get this to, to a, a place where it's, it's more insightful so that we can know uh, how each channel is performing, how each channel is contributing, like to your question, Andrew. And, mm. and see, you know, how each of those is contributing to um, our, our, our most important KPIs. I love the fact that it it, felt, it waterfalls all the way down to, to revenue and, yeah, number of customers. I mean, that's really is the, the bottom line metric there. Mm -hmm. We have an in input uh, refunds in here too. Yeah, so I just noticed refunds. that. Yeah, seemed like yeah. the absolute bottom line. So that's a measure of really how good the course is, right? Mm -hmm. Which is clearly right. clearly so important to yeah, important yeah. to another, care. Another one. You, you, go ahead. No, I was just saying. I think yeah. it's important to care by 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 evidence here, but also how it's something I've talked about a lot. That if you are delivering transformations, you're fueling your marketing engine in a big way, right? It makes your job easier, I would imagine. The fact that Kay's course, people are coming out of it being like, hey, this, this transformed my life. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. The, I mean, people come, come through the course out the door, out the other end, and they're, you know, they're, they're screaming his praises and praises for the program and how it's built and how it's put together. And a lot of it is on the experience of going through it, the cohort that you're working with, uh, the peers that you, you get to make friends with and learn from, or it's, it's really powerful. Just as mm -hmm. a, a, an idea here that I just, I just realized here that I didn't put this in, a, in another slide, but this is something we want to work on as well is to add one more layer to this, which is on referrals. So referrals, meaning not those from partners, mm -hmm. which, which I'm going to talk about soon, but also referrals from existing students. So that is an actual, a growth lever that you can think about pulling if you want to grow your course is to make it easier for people to refer their friends or family to take the course as well. We don't, yeah. we don't have a program for that yet. So I, I went through launch number one and that's really the meat and potatoes of the presentation. And now I'm going to go through launch two and three to just to give you a little bit of contrast 
into some of the other things that we worked on. So we started back at discovery again. And um, again, just to remind you, when we're doing discovery, these are the three things that we're looking at, your product, your content and funnels, and your launch strategy. And what we decided to do for launch two and three was really focus in on the, th the third phase, which is the, la the launch strategy. And for this, what we did is we decided to use this audience amplifiers playbook, a boot camp, and we and to improve our launch sequence. So again, just backing out, just zooming out a little bit so you can see the funnel again. At this point, we for launch number two and three, we incorporated this, so these audience amplifiers, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, um, into our funnel. This was already really uh, developed. We did a little bit of paid and, and retargeting, so we added a little bit more on the traffic side. In terms of this retargeting, what we call this content machine, so these are a series of emails. This was already very strong. We added a little bit of retargeting, so some remarketing ads on Facebook, um, and another channel that we use as well is called SharpSpring. So we, we use that in terms of retargeting. And then we started to do a little bit more here in the middle, which, which I'm not going to get into today. A boot camp, we, we incorporated a boot camp, which I'm going to show you, which is super effective. And then our launch as well. We got a little bit more sophisticated with how we're opening cart, offering bonuses, closing cart, things like that. So on to the audience amplifiers. Basically what this is, it is a, is a way to find other people that have an audience so that they can amplify Kay's audience, right? And so here you can see a few screenshots of him going on uh, a content roadshow before his, his, uh, his course launch. And this is what the audience amplifier playbook looks like, right? So this is a cheat sheet. You can grab this if you head over to nerddigital.com. There's a, there's, you can grab this cheat sheet and there's a walkthrough for you. But essentially these are like all the steps until you get, um, you can, you know, build your list. And the cool thing about this is that you could build your audience. You'll build your email list, get more people to know and like and trust you without spending a dime on Facebook ads. It takes work. You do have to, you know, create a list. You do have to, you know, add information about these people, research them to see if they're a good fit filter out, you know, what is the opportunity, uh, identify like what is that interest, that common interest that you have in this person, uh, what kind of problems can you solve and, and do you really want to pitch them, uh, measure what the, the opportunity looks like, get their attention. So this is the actual pitch sequence, follow up with them. Like this takes work for sure. It's, it definitely takes some elbow grease, but um, it can it can have a serious impact in, um, in your performance as we can see with uh, you know, as you were able to see with our performance with, with uh, launch six and seven, where we uh, did six-figure launches for both of those. So that's on the audience amplifier side. The second thing that we did is the boot camp. So this is something that Kay really crushed uh, was this idea of this boot camp. So this is the, the screenshot of the 10-hour, 10 10,000-hour 10, work boot camp. And really what you're doing with the boot camp is you're giving the what, and then you're teaching the how. Right. So in the boot camp, you give them the what. What is the skeleton of the framework? And at the end of your boot camp, you pitch them on an opportunity to teach them well, how to actually, you know, go and fill the the rest of it. A, a really good example of this uh, for, for a boot camp idea that I saw, or a pre-launch that I saw, was a guy saying that he would teach people how to sketch, so how to do just basic sketches. And then he would have an upsell, like a course after that on the back end, which was how to color in the sketches. So I, th I thought that was actually mm. a really good example. I don't know if you've seen any good examples out there, Andrew. I mean, I, I, I think I talk about this a lot. You can, you can sort of generalize it to, to almost anything where you can give people the content, the ideas, the concepts. It, people are always going to want help implementing it. And, and, and then the second was related to that because they're always going to have specific questions. Oh, wait, but how does this mm -hmm. apply to me? Or how does this thing, wh how do I, what do I do at this point? And that's where you're always going to have, like you say, um, you're always going to have the, the, they're always going to want you to teach them how. Yeah, exactly. Another thing that happens when you're doing a boot camp is that you build trust, you boost your, the likeness for your brand and for yourself, and you also increase sales. So in terms of building trust, what happens is you're showing and teaching people, right? So you're, you're showing up for them. Uh, if you can you do this over a three day period, five or seven day period, and you're teaching them, right? So you're really showing them that you have the expertise and you can help them cross that barrier, get across and, mm -hmm. and have that transformation. 
excuse me, what you're also doing is you're giving. You're giving a lot of information, giving a lot of your your face time, a lot of your your um, yourself to these to to people that attend the boot camp, and you're also engaging with them. So you're answering questions. If anybody raises their hand, if they have something specific, you can answer that right in the boot camp as well. And people get to see your face. That's something that we we heard a lot in uh, our customer interviews. Is as soon as I saw Kay's framework, as soon as I heard from Kay, as soon as I sat in front of Kay, like it's almost like. As soon as they liked him, they're like, "Cool, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll take, I'll take the next step. What, what's next?" Hmm. Another thing too that the boot camp does is it creates this scarcity. So it it fits really nicely into your launch by putting it a little bit before your when you open cart by saying, you know, okay, for the next day or the next two days, we have these bonus offers uh, for anybody that wants to take action today and join our course. Totally not mandatory or anything like that. It's just an offer, take it or leave it. But just so you know, it's only available for you know the boot camp people that took the boot camp, and only available available for the next 24, 48 hours or, or whatnot. In terms of performance, you can see that the conversion rates for the boot camp have been pretty solid. So the first time we ran the boot camp, uh, we ran the first time in for SYP six, we converted a little bit over four percent of people that attended the boot camp converted into paying customers, and then now we converted a little bit over five percent. So. This like I'm I'm super satisfied with this, and I think there's lots of opportunities mm. still with the bootcamp. Yeah, that's huge. That that five percent conversion rate on on something is yeah. massive in this in this game. It's it's massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to, to frame this too, it, these two activities were worth over five figures for us. Right, yeah. so we generated over five figures from this and over five figures from that. So this is really uh, serious. This- before you dive into launch, um, just on the on the, the boot camps, how many events were there? Were others involved that involved that audience amplification piece as well? Yeah, you know, what sort of went into the? And it, was it like in one week, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's one week. It was a one week boot camp, and Kay essentially showed up for between thirty and sixty minutes for each boot camp over the course of a week. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a five day, a five day event. And if I'm not mistaken, and uh, for some of the the days, he also had guests come along and present and help um, you know teach people basically during the the event. So it, it's cool because you end up combining a little bit of the audience audience amplifier playbook into your bootcamp, which is which yeah. is a cool thing to do as well if you, if you can if you can make that happen. And, and does, last question. Some, hmm. Sorry, you're gonna yeah. say it does take t- take some. It, it does take, um, you, you know, some solid relationship building. You know, if you're gonna invite yeah. somebody to come to your boot camp, if they're, it, it, it's not an easy thing to do. So not an uh, an easy ask. Yeah, and yeah, because you have to all fit it in all in the same week. Uh, and and how much programming was there per per day? Thirty minutes, sixty minutes, an hour. I mean, two hours. It was between thirty and sixty minutes per day. Okay, so yeah, so not super onerous for people to sign up for to to check out what the content's all about. Right, and another thing too is that if you think about it from a psychological perspective for the user, if they're joining the bootcamp and the bootcamp is free, then it's completely different from doing a webinar, for example. And the person shows up; they know it's recorded. They can still get value out of it, but uh, they don't really get to ask you questions or engage with you. It's it's not live. And if you show up, for example, if you were to do a three-hour webinar, that's not the same thing as showing up on three separate days for thirty minutes or an hour. The more days that you show up, it looks like it's a lot more, even if you just split the time across the days. Mm. What, what happens with people is that if you show up once and you teach them something. They go home, they sleep, and then they wake up the next morning with more ideas in their head. And they, they again, w- what you said, Andrew, is they always bring it back to their own context, their own situation. They have questions about how do they do it? How does this play into their life? And by separating things across different days, it allows your audience to have these realizations, to go on this journey with you as they're learning. And you start to unpack more and more uh, through the boot camp. It's awesome. Now to the launch. I just put the the sales page here, but there's a lot of little pieces to to the launch. And so just to zoom in here to the launch here, you know, there's there's your your sales page for sure, but 
there's the date of you open your cart, the bonuses, your upsells, any downsells, and then the day that you close your cart. And here I should actually have your, your sales page on here as well. This is how we performed in terms of sales per day. And if you've ever done a launch, you'll know that this graph does not look the way it should. Because oftentimes, most of your money comes in uh, at the beginning. So the day you open your cart here, and then at the end, when you when you close cart, right? Um, and the reason why, and I'm gonna get into this, into the mistakes, is we launched on a, on a very bad date. And um, so that was a really big mistake that we made. But yeah, just, just to give you an idea of what our, our sales numbers look like. Because I know that when you open cart, you're like, man, you're looking for you this huge spike in, in cash. And as days goes on, you expect it you know, maybe to climb, but that's not really how it is. Usually it's a big chunk in the first day and then the bigger chunk on the last day. And the launch happened after the boot camp, right? Open cart. Correct. Yeah. Okay. It it, com it coincided with the end of the boot camp. So right as the boot camp uh, closed, the the cart was open. Yeah. 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 And now to get into some of our mistakes. So anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. And I and I put this in here just to uh, cover myself, right? So I just put Albert Einstein on there, and you know if he said it, then okay, I'm okay with it. And when it comes to mistakes, we definitely made a few. So in their last launch, for example, we launched on a holiday and we didn't even realize it. I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly how this got past us, but we we launched with, with it. Um, I want to say Memorial Day weekend or Labor Day weekend or it was, it was some kind of holiday. Yeah. And the mood in the market at the time was, man, we're past COVID. We've been locked down for 12 months. It's sunny. It's the middle of summer. And this guy's offered me a course for me to sit at home. And are you kidding me? I'm out the door. I'm like, I have like people are just ecstatic. They want to be outside. They want to be in a stadium. They want to have the beer. They want to go to a restaurant, right? They just want to hang out with their friends yeah. and their families again. So, yeah. uh, this was one thing launching a holiday, but also the, the COVID impact. I think we underestimated a little bit. So the first few days of our launch were very scary in terms of our our performance. Another thing too that I would advise you to is to not overlook the value proposition of your course. And really what this means is to, to never overlook how clear you can make the transformation for your students to be, right? So is it clear, immediately clear, what you're going to offer and why that's important? does your value proposition pass what we call that 3 a.m. test, right? So if somebody's sleeping, if your, your, your ideal customer is sleeping, do they wake up in the middle of the night saying, oh, I wish I could X, right? Do I wish mm -hmm. if, you, if, you're, if your course is about um, increasing energy, right? Some people might create a course. I, this is a course to create increase energy. Does the people wake up 3 a.m.? Oh, if only I could increase energy. I don't know. Is that a question that your customer, your target audience has, your, your avatar has? Then great. If it's not, then then you know spend some time thinking about it. Another thing too is just your avatar. So making it very clear, this is something that we want to do a little bit a better job of, is making abundantly clear who this is for, right? Mm. Uh, and calling out the avatar more clearly and specifically, so that people can feel s spoken to and and. Um, we can we can optimize and improve our numbers. Now, looking ahead, the true future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. From Eleanor Roosevelt, I have a lot of dreams. I especially for this for for Rad Reads and for K, I, I believe that we can do a lot more. And so, these are some future experiments we want to do. So, we want to do a better job of using our customer interviews uh, for copy optimization, but also for the product. Uh, we've done a handful of, of interviews. Uh, shout out to Caitlin Burgoyne uh, for helping me with that, helping us with that. And uh, we we were able to learn a lot in that, but it's definitely a skill. You know, interviewing people is hard. It, mm. Not only in, in the sense of it takes time because you really have to sit there and ask the questions and listen to the questions, but it's also hard to... Uh, something we have to get better at 
is ask the questions and stay present as the person's answering and, and try to walk with them as they're answering the question. It's, it's something really hard to do. Well, the second thing it's, we're, it, it's sorry, just so again, um, we seem to have a bit of a delay. I'm sorry about that. Um, that is uh, crazy that you brought that up. I've been thinking about this so much because to me, one of the most important skills you can learn, and I teach this to my team a lot when we're working with clients to extract information from them, which is exactly what you're doing in a customer interview, right? That content extraction, that discovery is to like, just ask really good questions and then to s stand out of the way and let the person talk, like get that verbal diarrhea going and just, just keep it going with little questions, like, like dig a little bit deeper. Why did you think that? Or why was that important to you? To, to really make them think and, you know, and, and keep that momentum going. And, and like you say, just not to, to resist the urge to like want to even just resist the urge to document it, rather record it, ask for permission, record it, and then go back to it later, but just engage in that dialogue. Such a good point. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's, it's really difficult to do. And, and I've watched some experts do the interviews and you take it for granted when they're doing it. Cause you're just, you're just a passenger. But when you do it yourself, I, again, I'm a novice at this. Uh, after doing a, a handful of them, I'm still like, man, I, I, I should have asked this. Or as this person was saying that they were doing their annual review, it's like, well, why were you doing an annual review? Where, where were you yeah. at the time when you're doing an annual review? Oh, I was at home. So, oh, were you at your house or at your wife's house? Or was it your mom's house? Were you back home? Do, is that something that you do? You travel home for Christmas? Like, yes, mm. it, it's, it's, it's a really challenging thing to do. Mm. So future experience, experiments as well as refine the value proposition. This is definitely an area that we're going to focus more on is on the product. So if you remember from our three launches, we, we focus on the, the, the third phase, right? The launch, we focus on the second phase with our content and funnels, but we haven't spent as much time as we probably should on the product. And that's, that's an area where we're going to focus more on. So optimizing our value proposition, making it more clear and the avatar as well, and then increase distribution. And we'll probably do that with paid and social, um, mm. to increase distribution for, for our next, uh, next launch. So that's basically it. Uh, if you want to grab these slides, head over to nerddigital.com forward slash Andrew Barry, N E R D D I G I T A L.com forward slash Andrew Barry. And you can grab these slides. And I think if we have the replay, I'll try to put it up there as well. And just very quickly, if you want help to scale your course to six figures as well, uh, you're, you're totally welcome to, uh, to join our upcoming beta. You can head over to nerddigital.com and you can get more information there. This is a really quick overview of our program, the six figure course launch and Essentially, what we want to help you do is make uh, $100,000 in revenue from your course launch in 90 days without spending all your money on Facebook ads so you can work when and where you want. So you can see here these three phases, the exact same three phases that I've walked you through today in, in the work that we did with Kay. Um, you only, we only touched on a little bit of the content machine and a little bit of the amplifiers and a little bit of the launch sequence, but there are many other pieces to the puzzle if you want to get things right to have a six-figure launch. So again, if you want to join the beta group, um, we're launching in August. So uh, head over to nerddigital.com. If you have a cohort based course, if you're thinking about launching one, if it's maybe you've launched before and you just want some help, uh, head over there and, and we'd love to help you. Now, that's it from, from me. Um, Andrew, that, that's the end Amazing. of this presentation. Amazing. Marcia, that's so, so, so useful. And um, I, yeah, I have, was taking copious notes here for myself as well. Um, and we'll definitely be hitting you up. And I think everyone who's listening will be, would benefit from joining that group. I think to go into this in a lot more detail. Um, I want to, I want to bring up a couple of the questions. So yes, Nesreen, the recording will be sent out after this, um, to, to everyone registered. Um, and of course you can get the slides as I see you've posted, um, on my CEO's website. And then just a question from earlier from Isaac in Mexico. How long did it take to implement this strategy for K? Which, which strategy? Like all of this stuff? I, I think it was from earlier. So I think, yeah, probably all of it. I, I mean, maybe 
focused on on the first cohort, like what that discovery looked like, and then implementing those three tactics that you guys started to focus on. What, what did that look like? It was it was over the course of ninety days, essentially the the scope of work. So it was, it was pretty intense, but again, we tried to always be high leverage and always operate in this 80-20 type of approach. And so we're always trying to do what, what is really essential to move the needle for us. But it was over the course of 90 days that we worked together before the launch of uh, SYP5. And and what sort of intensity? Like meeting every day, once a week? It, it, it was. It, so it, it, it changed that time. So we, we had in our calendars a bi-weekly meeting. So we'd meet every Thursday or Friday and we'd meet for, you know, up to an hour or more. And then in between, we'd always be in touch through email. He he was on uh, WhatsApp as well. And so sometimes he would just come up with an idea, right? It's like, oh man, I'm thinking mm-hmm. about this and that. And what do you think about this? And we would just end up chatting on, on, on WhatsApp. So it was, it's been a great partnership. I feel so blessed to work with Kay and uh, it's that, mm. that's, that's how it's, it's been going so far. Yeah. Yeah. And so with someone like, Hey, you get to run these, these pretty wild experiments. He's, he's already got a, a pretty decent audience as well. Um, and you, you can get a lot of feedback and, and course great from that. Um, Nesreen, um, I think it was Nesreen. Yeah. has a great question of, of how would you, how would you recommend beginners start with implementing some of these ideas that you shared? Hmm. So, I think I would have to ask for more context on that question in terms of are you a beginner in your course creation journey? Is it is the course? So, new? yeah, so or there's a bit the... more there. She's starting a blog, um, and she's actually a TA on supercharge your productivity. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so she says she is um, starting a blog and would love to at some point teach a course. Oh, okay. So in that case, what I would do is I would go, and this might sound strange, is it's to work one-on-one with somebody. So if you have worked with one-on-one with somebody, for, so for example, if you worked one-on-one with somebody on helping them lose weight and your blog is on losing weight, cool, that's a, that's a good match. A natural evolution from that is to document the process that you use to help that person into a course because you have proof that that methodology works with somebody and you have a testimonial that, you know, you were able to help that person lose 10 pounds over 10 days or something, right? So whatever methodology you use, maybe that person, for example, was a pescatarian and you created a, an entire program just for her or for him. Mm. So that, mm. That's how I would do it. Go one-to-one. That's it, it. It's it's opposite sometimes to what you would expect because some people might recommend create a small course for $100 or something and try to do that. The thing with that is it's so difficult to get people's attention that if mm-hmm. you're going to build a blog and then buy ads and do all this stuff, the numbers won't add up. You won't be able to acquire customers then convert them into a paying customer if you're going to go the low ticket route. You really have to work one-on-one and charge a lot up front because you're working high intensity with somebody you know every day or every week to give them a, almost it's almost guaranteed transformation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could not endorse that more, uh, Nazreen. And for anybody who's just getting started is focus on one person. The other benefit to that is that you really hone in on your transformation. You really get specific on that because you, you're working with that person. You, you're getting the benefit of that face to face. Like you're hearing from them what, how it's benefiting from them and you're hearing from them what their uh, challenges are. So if you're getting very specific in what you're doing, whereas to your point, if you try to launch a course, hundred dollar course, and it's like this is what I think people want, it's very hard to get noticed, and it's also probably going to be too broad and too sort of unspecific to, to catch anyone's attention. So, yeah, I think that's that's really really good advice, and it feels counterintuitive, and and yeah, uh, yeah, like it takes a lot of time. Um, it looks like you're in the chat as well. Just to, to, to flag for you, Isaac's questions next. Can you share the text, the tech stack that uh, Kay uses? Mm-hmm. So on the on the website, we use WordPress, and now what we're we're going to implement for the next for the next launch is uh, a tool that we call it's called Cart Flows, and what this allows you to do is build funnels inside 
web uh, inside WordPress. So that's a plugin you definitely want to check out because this can allow you to do things like you can have several different types of funnels. So you can have a lead magnet funnel. Uh, you can also have a uh, a paid funnel so that somebody downloads something, shows them a video, and then after they maybe buy the course or get upsell sold into the boot camp, for example, right? So it, it helps to to create that experience. Um, on the back end for email, we use ConvertKit. The hosting platform for the course, of course, delivery is on Podia. The uh, courses themselves, the live sessions are on Zoom. Uh, and the community is on Slack. And I believe, so we use Google Analytics for tracking, Google Data Studio for reporting. Google Sheets is pretty heavy as well in our stack. Um, Google Tag Manager to track custom events. I think Zapier that's, that's to it, yeah. connect it all. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we use Zapier as well. Yeah, actually, Kate yeah. handles, handles all the Zapier stuff. And okay. he uses Airtable when he, when he launches as well because he wants to track sales through there. And we mm -hmm. also, we're starting now with, with some Facebook ads, so it's part of our acquisition stack, I guess you could say. Yeah, it's Facebook. yeah. Very cool, very cool. I, yeah, it's a, it's a solid stack for sure. Um, so Sushi, I think she is in France, um, has a question here. Um, created a course with eight welcome, beta welcome. testers. It was very successful. I want to launch it, but I don't, know, I don't have a website or YouTube channel. What do you recommend I do first if I want to launch in September? Hmm. So officially it's launched, I would say that you, yeah, I'd say that you've already officially launched. The moment that yeah. you, so so the, the essential pieces of the puzzle are you have to have the product. Again, those, those three pieces, right? You want to have the product, your content and funnels, and then you want to have some kind of launch sequence uh, to get people in the door. And so in terms of your product, it looks like you already have that down. That is the most important part. The next part in terms of your funnel, try to do something as as basic as possible. It, basically, what you're trying to do is is create a way for new people to get to know you and to turn into a lead. So you have to create at least one lead magnet, put that on a page somewhere, on a, on a website, set up a basic WordPress website, or use ClickFunnels, which is uh, it's, it's a little bit more expensive, but it, it does that for you. Create a lead magnet, attach it to a form, and you know that's your funnel, so that you can have people to announce your launch to. So the next step after that would build a sales page, and then your sales page. That's where you're going to put you know the description of your course, the price, and everything. And I think that's the basic funnel setup that you would need to to officially quote unquote launch. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. Um, we got a lot of French French love in, in the audience. Yeah, um, it is definitely uh, very good advice. And I know my my camera has disappeared for a second. Um, but yeah, I, it's I, the overriding thing for me as well in that in that um, in that in that question is that just keep it simple. Like just get get d demonstrate expertise, demonstrate transformations, get those testimonials, and just keep building. But don't overthink necessarily that the, the tech side of it. Mm -hmm. um, um, oh, video ask. Yeah, Isaac, I've heard of that tool. Video yeah. ask. That's uh, I, I really like that tool. I haven't used it myself, but yeah, thanks for bringing that up because that, that was on my on my list of things to do is to to try and use that. It's a really good tool. So if anybody's listening, they don't know what video ask is. It's it's a um, it's a tool that helps you to ask for for testimonials. And I ha I have someone that I worked with before that they use it, and it's really cool. So a question here from Nazreen: Would you recommend to put the testimonials on the landing page or in a separate page? That's a great question. So I would use testimonials whenever you're trying to convert somebody. The testimonial is there to to help build trust, right? So if ever you're asking somebody to give your email or give their money away, then you want them to trust you, use a testimonial and use it as many times as you can or as you have to. So you could put it on a landing page, meaning where they convert into a lead or so they just give you your email or on a sales page. Uh, use the, um, the testimonials there as well. You can also use it on a page like on a booking page. 
So if you have mm-hmm. a page where you're asking someone to book a call with you, book a, a strategy session or something like that, you can also put testimonials on that type of page because, again, you're asking that person to follow through on, and take action on, on the booking. Yeah. And then, like you said, you can you can use a lot of that and, and the more detailed conversations behind it in your sales copy as well, mm-hmm. the emails and all that sort of thing. Yeah, one thing one thing I was thinking about, Andrew, <laughs> is about the title of your of this chat right how did you learn that yeah and and if, if i were like if somebody if you were to ask me that like how did you learn how to do this for k my answer is yeah. i took a bunch of courses hmm that a let's bunch. go down that part let's, yeah can you elaborate on that because I, I this is fascinating i could i love this kind of stuff man i took i like so I, like I said, I've been doing this stuff for the past seven years, like focused strictly on digital marketing. And so when I started, mm. um, I was working agency and uh, my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And so I wanted to spend more time with her. I took her to the gym every day, you know, spent all my time as much as I could. Then my son was born. And so I really wanted to be home as much as possible. And in doing so, I was like, man, I, I got to get out of this job. There's people running me. I just there's too much work and so i mm. left i got a client to do a web design project and then from then i took like an seo course and i took a web analytics course with avinash kaushik the, the absolute guru of, of web analytics took a, a, like an seo course a technical seo course took an email marketing course a content marketing course a paid a paid advertising course um, and then after i took all these courses then i actually just started doing jobs i, I got any mm. kind of gig that i could i did a lot of seo mm. for people Content marketing for people helps, you know, a bunch of brands. And through that, I took courses like Brian Dean bought some of his courses already, right? So if you know uh, backlinko.com, he is, uh, I love I love his stuff. I love his style. Um, I still use a lot of his, his teachings and implement a lot of those for my clients. Um, Ryan Stewart from the, the Blueprint as well on the SEO side, learned a lot from him, bought his stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, Brian Dice bought some of his stuff as well. So digitalmarketer.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I bought uh, oof. Aaron Fletcher, another f- absolute master. This guy's really good. One of the best teachers I've ever had. Um, mm-hmm. Brian Harris as well. Studied mm-hmm. studied from Brian Harris as well. Video fruit. Um, yeah. Video fruit. Yeah, I've, I've I've studied a lot, man. Um, and those are just just courses, right? Besides, like mm. you know, the stack of books that's that's back there somewhere. Yeah, and then yeah. just doing and running experiments. Yeah, just doing, and it's not glamorous for sure. Like I think now, I I'd say it, I'm almost I'm, I'm slowly turning my car this way, where I'm I'm trading less of my time for money. Which I think is, mm. is, 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 has been the goal ever since I left the agency. It's, it's like, okay, how can I earn without being at the agency full time, giving away all my time? Now I'm a little, mm. I'm very, very close to being able to do that. Now I have, you know, a few coaching clients right now. And so that's, that's the, that's, the, that's a good side, but, um, definitely yeah. have more, more to, to grow and learn. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts to share on how um, you're you're scaling your ability to work with people? Like, have you are you building systems to do this? Have you been hiring? Thinking about hiring? Uh, anything on that? It's definitely a topic of my mind, and I think for a lot of course creators, uh, is is you know how do we how do we scale this ability to do what we do? Yeah. So what we're doing now is again like the effort here with the beta launch is to do this in a group setting. So similar to the, all the ideas that we share in the frameworks that we actually share my screen, I'll show you something inside Notion to show cool. you what we're building inside Notion for our program. And this is what I'm walking a few customers through right now. Uh, let me put this here. And so after obviously taking Kay's course and working with him, I got sucked into Notion. Yeah. So here. <laughs> And it surprises me every day. So this is Such what. A great um, so this is what our course looks like in here, right? So I showed you that course roadmap, but once we mm-hmm. jump into to Notion, then we have our nine modules here. We have some actually some bonus ones here as well, 
And, and so inside, um, you're asking about scaling. What this does mm-hmm. is we have these workbooks in here, and then I can share this with my clients or with any of the students, and then they can just go and fill them in, right? Mm-hmm. So filling in your, your power profile, for example, right? So getting clear on your avatar. This helps them mm-hmm. unpack some of those questions and, and do some research. Uh, the customer quadrant, mm-hmm. this is a super fun activity that I love to do. And so I have videos here on how to fill out the quadrant and or how to use this in Notion. So you can use the Notion uh, or you can use the, I have this in PowerPoint, so people can do that in PowerPoint mm-hmm. as well. And so this is one way that I found is, is helpful to scale, is to keep the, these documents and refine these documents and, and help people and even help myself get better at getting clear on who your favorite customer is uh, and then later creating a standout value. So we have a few worksheets for these as well. So we have this standout value ladder. Um, hmm. And then, you know, I have the steps in here. So in here, this is one way that, that we're, we're using this to scale. And mm. another way is, is from a, for a, a VA. Where's the screen? I, I hired a VA yeah. just uh, not too long ago. So that's also been a process because it, it takes some getting used to not doing the things yourself, but stopping, documenting, teaching, creating a video and SOP for somebody else to do the work. And then yeah. being being consistent with asking for help. That's something that I've been working on only for the past, I'd say, two months now. So that mm. those are the two ways I'm trying to scale. Asking for help from the VA or from mentors mm-hmm. and from the VA? Yeah. Yeah, from the VA. So so far it's from the VA. I, I definitely have like I, I hire other coaches as well. And so, you know, I, I have I book sessions with them and to help me with my process yeah. and help me with my thinking. Yeah, I do that too. Yeah, yeah. That, I find the the beauty of that it's uh, it's this constant push pull of a coach can really help you get unlo- unlock something, right? Like get like keep moving, like unlock that that sort of inertia that, that sets in, and then um, and then working with the VA can keep that momentum going. But you've got to put in double time at the beginning to 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 like you said create the SOP, give feedback for a, a few times until it's you know you're really happy with it and. Yeah, but once that's really like like that's really ten k stuff, eventually, like like Kay talks about. Mm-hmm. What, um, Ray Dalio, he had this idea in his book Principles. He said that every time I meet with somebody, I want I want to be able to delegate at least ten hours of work to that person. That was like his mm. his baseline of um, measurement when he was started delegating and he started building a team, and then later on. He would say, okay, if I'm going to meet with this person and give this ten, this person 10 hours, I want that person to be able to give 10 hours of work to somebody else. Yeah. And so yeah. then he would have, he would be managing like a team and that team would be delegating tens of hours to other people. Right. So then yeah. his one hour with that person transformed into like a hundred. Yeah. So that's a, it's huge. an interesting idea for them from him. High, high leverage stuff, yeah, and compounding, the power of compounding as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, so Marcia, this was just so supremely valuable. I'm looking forward to going over the recording myself and, uh, and, and picking out some ideas here. And, um, any, any last words you'd like to leave people with, um, both in, in, two, in two respects? One, I know you mentioned the, the, the um, beta uh, group cohort that you're launching. Um, there's also a way to go get the slides. I'll include both of those in, in an email that goes out to everyone afterwards. But anything else you'd like them to check out? And then any closing thoughts or, or words of wisdom that you'd like to share? Yeah, so th- I think the last uh, two things there is, is definitely if you're if you're interested in launching your cohort, uh, head over to nerdjigital.com so you can be part of the beta. And we'll walk you through the exact same stuff that we helped K-, help K with. And the second thing is the... The coaching. So you said something about coaching is that coaches can help you get unlocked. And one thing that uh, I learned from another coach, his name is Mastin Kip. He's, a, he's, he's, he calls himself, I think it's a trauma informed specialist in, in healing or something like that. I read his book, um, Unleash Your Power, I think, or Unlimited Power. It's a really good book and it's the number one bestseller. And one thing that he, he talks about in there is that every time you're doing something new, your nervous system 
tells you not to do it because your nervous system knows it's new, and by knowing it's new, it knows it's dangerous. If there's mm-hmm. danger, then your your nervous system, your brain, your mind, whatever, is going to try and stop you. That's its job. It's to protect you. It's to keep you alive. Your brain doesn't know the difference between taking a chance and dying. It doesn't. It just knows that they're both dangerous, and so it's like, mm-hmm. don't die, don't go into danger, don't do it. Your brain will mm-hmm. do that to you. It'll t- it'll come up with. It, it's creative, and it, 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 it that's its job to help to keep you safe. It doesn't mean you're broken. You're not broken. Mm. It just means mm. that with a coach, sometimes someone can walk beside you, and they can go, help you go on this journey that they've already gone before, and they can help you to take different steps. Because in order for you to, obviously, if you want to get somewhere different, you have to take different steps. And by doing these new steps, it feels hard a lot of the times. It's it's scary. It's It's uncomfortable. So... Working with a coach can also help at that level, this emotional level, which I think is is like mm. the biggest thing. Uh, Yuval Harari, which is the guy, if you, it's just my guy. Yuval Harari, he was mm. asked by Tom Bilyeu, what is the future of education look like? And is it, you know, it's college, university, like what is the future of work and, and future of education? I think that was the question. Mm. And his answer was awesome. He said that, the future of education is going to be more like instead of building your house on this solid foundation like a rock, a you know build a building and build on top of it and build many floors as a way to you know build your career and your your knowledge. It's going to be more like a base camp where you're just carrying around a tent. You have to have the flexibility to pitch a tent, set it up. Oh, a storm is coming! You know, tear your your, your tent down, run, and set it up somewhere else. With the rapid changes, the rapid movement in technology and the way we're working, even you know, with, with COVID, for example, we've seen this, you have to be able to adapt. And it's not so much learning. Like, sure, you can learn how to use a cell phone. You can learn how to use a tool or something like that. But it's how often and how much will you have to transform yourself from here to there. Yuval says that, yeah. for example, in the past, you could get a job and you could retire in that job. So essentially, you're not changing ever. You're maybe learning a few new things, new skills on the job. But nowadays, you can enter the market as a web designer. Five years from now, or even less, AI is going to take over and web designers be automated, right? So there's websites that can be created for you. And then after that, okay, cool, I'm not a web designer, I'm a copywriter. Cool, you're still working on the web. There's still similar things. But now you're just working on the copy. It's like, well, now AI is taking over that too. It's like, well, okay, well, how do I make the next shift? And at this point, you're 60 years old. So you're 60 years old. The, the previous shift that you made, you were 55. You're 60. You still have to work until you're 80 because you're going to live to 100 and something, right? Because people are going to live longer. And now it's like, okay, now you're going to have to be a yoga instructor. Why? Because all the digital skills that were needed before, the jobs, they're gone. So he's saying that at some point, there's going to be this shift, this jump, where you're going to have to have this huge transformation. Maybe you're going to be like a yoga instructor inside AI, uh, a virtual reality spaces, for example. Mm. How do you sh- uh, how do you mentally and emotionally make that change? Your identity, your image of yourself, your idea of yourself, and the idea of who you were, who you work with, with the conversation, like all this stuff is attached to your identity and to your to yourself. It's you you may think that I just have to read a book and and go, but it's not that simple. It's hard. Mm. And cohort based courses are the answer are the answer for that because mm. in a cohort. You're with other people. You can look at their faces and see, I'm scared. Like, I'm uncomfortable. Mm. I'm me too. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm, mm. I'm in Chicago. Like, I'm in Tunisia. I'm in, yeah, we're, we're all mm. in this together. Like, we're all suffering the change. Yeah. We're all, like, we're all adapting. Let's, let's just take one step. Another step. Yeah. That's it. That's it. I love That's that. Long that long such a, that was such a beautiful way to, to end this. It brings out all those thoughts and identity. And, and I think those that have embraced their own identity as course creators or just creators in general are the ones that are going to be able to make that jump a lot easier that you talked about. So, um, yeah, great, great way to, to close it out there, Marcia. I, I had so much fun listening uh, to this and learning from you. And yeah, just thank you so much for spending the time with us today. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Andrew, again. Uh, I hope to talk to you again soon.